come tonight, again, God, as always, uh, on our utmost hearts, God, we lift our country up to you, our leadership, uh, God. Uh, I just pray, uh, we pray that you would just uh, convict their hearts um, and make the appropriate changes that we need to in our country, God. Please uh, uh, stand us back up as Christians. Uh, but again, we do pray for the direction of our country, God, currently, please. Uh, for those still suffering with COVID, God, we pray for them. And for a world that has adopted a pattern of almost being afraid of everything these days, God, I, I just pray that, again, we'll remember who we are in Christ uh, and, and the strength that we have in Him. To our prayer list tonight, um, I just lift those names up to you, God, each one of them. Uh, we pray that you would uh, work your will in each of these lives, God, uh, strengthening, lifting, uh, and supporting, God, where need be. Uh, and we thank you for the opportunity to come to your throne and, and to bring these names to you, God. And we thank you for those that have brought their names up because we know that when we pray for others, good things happen. Uh, as Steve said tonight, God, we know the power of prayer. Uh, maybe not always in our timing, uh, but again with Teresa, we've seen what prayer will do, God. Answered prayers. We've, it's not the first that we witness, God. And we pray that you will bless us with more. To our efforts here at the church, God, the different activities coming up this month, we pray for safe travels. Uh, we pray for uh, good attendance, God, in, uh, in, in the fact of sharing Christ with others, uh, that we continue to be the lighthouse here in this community and on this road and in this area, God, in this, in this, uh, in this little town, God. We just pray that you would uh, keep our lights on, please. Thank you for all that you allow us, and thank you for your awesome, wonderful grace and forgiveness and forbearance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. If you would tonight, turn to Exodus, and we're going to finish this. I'm, I promise you we're going to finish this, this part of Exodus. It'll be at Exodus chapter 4. And for those who have been here, uh, we've been talking about, this was an extension off of our conversation about uh, confidence in Christ. Uh, and I picked... Uh, basically picked Moses because in Exodus 3, and we went through this last week in Exodus 3, or the last two or three weeks we've been talking about Moses, he made a great example because uh, in Exodus 1, uh, he spoke to Moses and, and, and Moses immediately gave him excuses for why he couldn't do, basically he called on Moses to do what? Pull Egypt out of, I mean uh, Israel out of Egypt, not Egypt out of Israel, that's a, that's a whole different thing. But so he called on, on, on Moses um, and, and, and we know this because when we go back, like I said before, in chapter 2, we know Mo Moses is past, right? We know that he was a, a murderer. So the whole point to this whole deal was it really removes our excuses really quick when you start studying these Bible characters and really looking at their lives and how they're applicable to us. So I spent some time in Exodus, uh, the whole chapter of, of, of chapter 3, the past two or three nights. But just as a quick recap... If you, if you want to make a note, in verse 1 we looked at the point that there was no excuse for our past. And part of this stems from the fact that we studied uh, two or three, four weeks ago, the fact that God uses us, and if he was looking for purity, perfection, um, what else would we say, righteousness, he wouldn't have used us in the first place, right? That's right. So that's really the basis of all of it, really, is for us to realize that, and this is really what, what we're driving at in this whole thing, is that when we step aside and let God work through us, then God gets what he needs from us because he doesn't see us the way we see each other, nor does he see us the way we see ourselves. We see all the flaws and characters and fears, and that's what Moses was really saying here. He, as you go through this, he kept putting up excuses of why he could not. First of all, like I said, from where he was coming from, uh, being from his past in verse 1. In verse 2 through 5 in Exodus 3, uh, this is the story of the burning bush. Uh, God speaking from the bush, and we kind of had a good time with that, talking about the fact if you walked out on your porch one morning and you had a bush on fire and a voice coming out of it, you'd probably, be running. <laughs> probably so. I mean, that would be kind of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking it uh, would be kind of a challenging situation. But the main point, too, was that uh, a part of this deal was talking about the fact that God prepares us for the things that he has for us. And I tell you this over and over again, God will not put you in a place that he doesn't, one, prepare you for, and two, you're not supposed to be there. He's not going to put you there. He won't do it. Again, because I keep telling you, he wants to use you. Why would he ever embarrass you? Why would he ever put you in that spot? The whole point of it is for him, for you to be a witness for him. So, uh, in that, it's always a strengthening thing. So uh, in verses 2 through 5, I, I look at it as God calls to us. He seeks us out. He's got a plan for us. You, you, and we've talked about this. You've got those quiet voices. Hey, you know. And the question is, when you hear that, hey, would you do this? 
do you respond and do it? That's the question. Uh, in verse 6, uh, God reminds, uh, reminded uh, Moses, and I, I like to think of it as God reminded us in that example. In verse 6, God reminded us of who he is. And in verse 7, and Joe, as we debated this somewhat, God does identify his goals for Moses and what he has planned for him uh, going into Egypt. In verse 8, God reminds us of who's doing the work. And that's probably one of the most critical things that we have to overcome is who is actually doing the work. We're the vessel. Again, we know these things. But this is the argument we have all the time is, God, I can't do that. God, I can't do that. God, that's not me. God, I, no, I, no God, no God, no God. And we forget, again, who is doing the work. And that's really the way I look at verse 8. Uh, in verses 9 and 10, again, God reminds Moses of the goal and his mission, what he's going there for uh, and why he's going there. Verse 11, he shows examples of Moses, or excuse me, verse 11 shows Moses and gives our excuses. Once again, here's it's Moses, us. here's us. Okay, now go, go back. We've got the burning bush. We've got the voice of God coming. I don't know what God's will. It said the voice sounds like mighty rushing waters. I don't know what it sounded like that morning, but to identify himself as you're standing on holy ground, that had to be pretty tra tra traumatic, right? I mean, especially now, remember, go back before television, but when you still had an imagination, or you didn't have an imagination because some of the things that we see today have been influenced by the, the world around us, right? So go back to this time period, and you got a guy living in the back of the desert with some sheep in a tent, right? So... Whatever that was, you know, I mean, today we've been so desynthesized by, you know, uh, automated movies, uh, special effects. Uh, Anything can be real today. Yeah, it's really, I mean, bless our children. I mean, how do you know sometimes what's real and what's not anymore? Because it's so, you know, so well done, so vivid. But in this, Moses gives in verse 11, he gives his first set of excuses. But again, verse 12, God comes back and he's very patient. That's the whole point to that, that verse. He's very patient. He's forbearing with us. Again, that's a great word. I love that word because it's kind of like patience plus, right? It's beyond patience. It's I'm going to continue to deal with you. Uh, and we'll see this again in chapter 4. In verses 13 through 17, God again reminds us of who he is. Uh, and that's really important because he continues to reinstate who I am, what the facts are. Um, and again, Moses still has some pushback for him. Uh, verse 18 reminds us, once again, it's not by our works, but it's through the works of God or the works that God does through us. Again, same kind of message, same support, but those are the facts of it. And then in this one I really like, in 19 and 20, he really outlines a strategy against Pharaoh. So, Joe, you and I have talked a little bit about the funny part that God sometimes calls you to do something and he doesn't give you quite all the details. Like when he called Moses, he didn't say, I'm going to run you to the corner. And if you study that, he took them to the corner, right? He took right. them to a specific way for a specific purpose. Because once again, he wanted to prove what? I am your God, right? You're not doing this yourself. I'm doing this. But in this particular part, he does outline the strategy of what he's going to use against Pharaoh. Now, he didn't get into every detail and every plague, and every, but he basically outlines. So... God does give you some of the facts of what you're getting into, right? Uh, and then the other part of that is when God's calling to you or talking to you, are you having a conversation with him, right? God, what's my purpose? Uh, good example. Uh, got to talk to Tamara. I think I'm saying that right. Tamara. Saturday night. Tamara. 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 Cindy. Kathy. I don't know. It's a lot of pressure. But she said, and I, was, I, will, I will hope she'll share this testimony later, but uh, in a very heartfelt response, she said, you know, I've been listening to the studies and the conversations about ministry, what God has for me, and I kept saying, I really, I just don't know where I fit. I don't think I have any qualifications. And then this opportunity with, to stay with Teresa came up, right? Mm -hmm. And she was just so excited that she's getting the opportunity to do ministry and just I think it's last week or the week before I said you have to remember it doesn't all happen here it's not all about being a teacher <laughs> song leader preacher it's not all about what goes on inside this building ministry extends outside of here and where you get called to you know now she had to make some adjustments in her work schedule but just she was more she was just so grateful that God gave her an opportunity to be used you know and when you look at her last few months, uh, you know, losing her husband, the things. The other thing she was grateful for was the people that he had put in her life the last few weeks, and I'm sure that includes 
I know Butch, your friends with her. I know she has some friends at Gilmer. She also brought up the church. Uh, obviously, the things that we're teaching here. So, again, to come out of something that would be perceived to be negative, losing a loved one, right? Especially your husband or a wife. And then, you know, to come to this point, we're just tearful, joyful that, hey, God used me for something, you know, and to be humble and grateful about it. So that's that's kind of that deal. Um, Plus, it probably allowed her to be able to. <clears throat> Yep. Yep. And sometimes that's a good thing. Like I said Sunday, sometimes you just need to get down and get quiet sometimes. It's not always about talking. Sometimes you can just sit down on the floor, uh, lean over the couch, get quiet, put your head down, put your nose on the ground, if you, whatever you're comfortable with, and just just listen for a little while. Let, let him talk to you for a little bit. I promise. It's, you, we don't always have to. It's hard for us to do, right? Especially for a guy up here waving his hands and talking. So, anyway, so God outlines the strategy against Pharaoh. And then in verse 21 and 22, the really cool part is God basically tells, hey, not only am I going to bring you out of Egypt, but the people that are your captors are going to reward you. They're going to bless you as you go out. That's the reward. That's the return. Now, to me, <clears throat> there is some subtle, uh, subtle picture here of how God works in our lives because we accept Him. Uh, we live on this earth, right? And if you really look at our position on this earth, we're really captives in this world. If you want to look at it from that perspective, we are lost. We are saved in a lost world. This is not this is not our home, right? So it's very, I mean, maybe I'm stretching it, but this way I feel about it. We're, we're, we're in Egypt, right? We are looking for that, we're looking for that relief. We're looking for that, that, resur that resurrection from where we're at. And again, very symbolic. Again, God pulls Israel out of Egypt and ultimately leads them to where? Promised land. Promised land, right? Was it hard? Yeah, we got documentation. We go through page after page of decisions made, things that happened, who, who went in and who, but the bottom line was very symbolic of how we look at our lives is in the same reward and intent that is right here very simply. And the only reason I bring that up is because, again, I continue to challenge you when you're reading Bible stories. And I remember two years ago we had this whole debate. Are they stories? Are they historical facts? Call them what you want. But when you look at a Bible story, we can take it for self-value. Moses led Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. Moses crossed the Red Sea. Moses followed the burning, heard the burning. Or do you look and continue to look, how does, how, why is this here? How is it applicable to my life? Yeah, it's a representation of what we're going through itself. There you go. That's all I'm really trying to say. So if you look in chapter 4 tonight, we're not going to go through the whole thing. Matter of fact, I'm going to roam off for a few minutes. But in chapter 4, uh, 1 through 13, he kind of completes this task with Moses. He's, and this, is, this, again, is God preparing Moses for what's coming. Uh, and he continues to try to prepare him, to strengthen him. He's trying to overcome his excuses. He's trying to overcome his, uh, his fear of things. He gets in a little bit more detail tonight. And, or you could look at it from this is Moses, and this is where we're at a lot of times. This is Moses uh, continuing to doubt or understand the ability of God, right? Now remember, this is post -Bible, uh, pre Bible, right? So we're reading what was written, but this is live, right? I mean, so, but from that perspective, this is probably the bigger study of the struggle that we have is really understanding the ability that God has in our lives when we allow him to. Because, we, we, again, we come to him with this, right? This is what I can't do. Hmm? I can't run that fast. I can't. And this is what Moses says as we go through this. He says, I can't. I can't. What if? What ifs, right? It's all those, it's all those what if things that he talks about. So in this situation, that's another way you can look at it that Mo God is preparing Moses. Or you can look at it that Moses is learning to trust God. Either or. It comes out to the same conclusion. But he's testing. In verse 4, he said, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to us. I wanted to spend, I'm going to roam off a little bit, just for a moment on that word, suppose. And think about yourself. God's spoken to you, asked you to, to do something. But there's that word, right? Suppose. Suppose. So I had to look the word up just to make sure. And suppose states that assume that something is the case based on evidence or probab probability, but without proof or certain knowledge. It's a hypothesis, isn't it? It's an hypothesis of our opinion, isn't it? Suppose. 
But supposing, I'm supposing, Butch, I suppose. And as I looked at that, I kept thinking about what's the proof of a certain knowledge or your future regardless of your decisions, right? Actually, that would be more of a theory or a, than a hypothesis. Back. <laughs> well, I'm still going to go with hypothesis. Only well, because logic. hypothesis is an imagined uh, circumstance where uh, supposing, uh, like suppose you spoke to God, uh, th kids. there's a... Uh, there, there's some influence that leads you to believe that. Okay. Either way you want to go, I'm supposing you're right. Welcome back, Bernie. Bernie, Bernie, no, it's all good. Well, see, here's what I wanted to do. Regardless of suppose, hypothesis, or theory, all of those, for me, still say the same thing, which is I have an opinion, right? It's my, see, and what I'm trying to say is we have to overcome our perceived perception, our opinion, our, our supposed, I like the other word, no, that's what I started to say ought to, ought to is my other weak word, but that doesn't really apply in this case, but again, it's all about our decision of who we think we are, and this is where Moses was, Moses was evaluating the fact of this is who I am, and this is who this person is that's asking me, this being, right, it's God is asking me to do these things, I am having this debate, right? And that's what he keeps saying as we look at the scripture. He continues to debate his abilities versus what God is doing. Now, think about it. Uh, God already knows the outcome of your choice in your life. But he doesn't control what? Your thoughts. Your choice. He already knows the outcome of your choice. But he doesn't control your choice. He just knows which one you're going to make. Well, think about it. I was thinking about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. God knew the judgment, and I'm using that word as judgment or consequence. That He already knew. God already knew that the consequence, maybe a better word than the judgment, but either way, uh, would be both good or. He, he already knew the consequence of what either excuse me either good or bad for their decision to eat the fruit, right? Yeah. See, before they ever made the decision, now He gave them what? Free will. The decision. He gave them the decision, right? Noah, before Noah built the ark and the rains came, God already knew what the judgment would be, good or bad, before those who ever decided to get on the ark or not, right? But he gave everyone else there. How many people went on the ark after 125 years? Eight. 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 We don't know how much population was at that time, but it was more than eight, right? But God, the point to this is, see, God already knew <laughs> the outcome. He already knew pro when we come to that decision path, right? I'm going to go this way or that way. God already knows the outcome. He didn't build the Titanic thinking nobody would come, right? There you go. And Jonah, before Jonah made his decision not to initially go to Nineveh, God knew the judgment was both good and bad for his decision, right? God knew where he was going if, but you see, here's the thing. If, right? If he decided not to follow God's will, where did he go? In the fish. He went into the well, or the giant fish, or the big fish, right? Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Rahab the harlot, before she decided to help Israel, <clears throat> Uh, the spies of Israel. God knew the consequences both good or bad for her decision, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose. Ruth, before she decided to go back to Israel mm -hmm. with her mother-in-law, God already knew the consequences both good or bad for her decision, right? Mm -hmm. Moses, as we study him in this these, uh, chapter and a half, God already knew the decisions of where he was going one way or the other, depending on what, though? His choice. Yeah. His choice. That's the beautiful part. He gives us this choice. Everyone listening in this room, before we make our next decision, no matter how great or small, God already knows the consequence. And again, that consequence kind of has that heavy, evil, mm -hmm, judgment feeling to it, but I'm really using it as he already, there's a consequence to your choice. Right? And not to jump ahead, but part of my concern is in the world today, we say, we suppose, hmm, by the evidence that we know, this is the way we live our lives. And I'm really talking to the direct lost world right now. When I look at some of the stuff that I see going on in, in the way that they say, like we said Sunday, this wall is not really white, it's blue now. Hmm? Really right? Is. Yeah. It's in the way man says, this is the world, this is the way I see the world, this is the way we're going to live. My point to this is, 
good or bad, God already knows the consequence to the choice, right? He already knows what's going to come from this. And my point to it is that at some point, He is going to come back and realign facts. Because we've already, we can read that. I mean, what He's already got to do is pick up the last book of the Bible and you know He knows. That's the know. whole point to it. This whole book drives you to the point of understanding final consequence to our choice. But no matter the choice we make, right? No matter what choice we make, this is ultimately where you're going to end up. That's, and, and I don't know if that's true. Uh, is it because of man's law? It's a reason, right? It's one of the things that kind of keeps us more somewhat bound to each other, right? That we have laws. I mean, we're finding out that if you totally destroy a police department, guess what? Don't destroy a city. <sighs> Thank you. The, the, uh, please forgive me, but the animals are still loose, right? So, uh, is it because of the Bible? No. Why? Well, because the choice is man. It is the man's, but I guess what I was trying to drive at, though, the Bible is instruction and Bible is direction, but Bible is almost, not almost, Bible is that, that instruction, man. It's that <laughs> reminder, right? It's what he, he reminds us. If you, if you want to know, like you said, you want to know how it ends? Right. You want to understand how God works? Well, yeah, you want to understand, huh? No, it's the owner's manual. It's the owner's manual. It's, yeah, it's, it's the one that drives us that way. If you the owner's manual, you, know, you suffer the, your unintent, unintended consequences. Well, the more I missed the first part. What was it? If you don't follow the owner's manual, you suffer the unintended consequences. There you go. There you go. Well, as more time goes by, it, you would think that uh, you know we're, we're able to look at the world kind of like on the back side, I guess. So the, the more time passes by, the more prophecy is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You would think that the world would pretty soon say, uh-oh, look, we're almost here at Revelation. I mean, you know, we're almost here. Let's just turn around. Yep. But instead, it seems like it's gaining speed. Mm -hmm. that you, they have to know what it says to be able to. But that's the law, that's the law of lostness. Yeah. Right. That's the lostness. That's. But see, where I was, I was kind of pulling y'all a little bit because, I, and I like to. I mean, that's where I was kind of to get you to think about the fact that. There, but here's the fact of life. In John one one through five, it says what? In the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing that was made was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend, because there is God. Why am I bringing that up? See, sometimes we are trying to understand why, why are you asking me, to, who, am I ta who am I dealing with, right? And part of the situation is he's never going to come to you and say, you have to do this. Right. He's going to give you that choice, right? Just like he gives in our lives all the time. Sorry, he gives gonna, us this choice. You're going to know. You're going to know huh? He didn't make Jonah. He encouraged him, right? You're going to know because you gave Jonah a second chance. Before you sin, why you sin, and after you sin. If you know the, yes. If you know that, yes. so you know. Ah, but good point. But what God, about the lost? What God does is, is once you do that and you make that commitment to make that sin, then he makes you feel so separated from it because you know that sin can't enter. God is, so your your time with God is wasted because you can't get to it. You can, you may talk to Him, but you're not understand what He's saying to you because sin is blocked away. And two things in that. But what about the lost? Right. The lost. Well, even, the, the, wait, 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 wait. You had your time. Even the lost knows right from wrong. Right. That's because God wrote it on their hearts. To know the difference between that right and wrong, and, I, and, and I tell know you, the truth most, when they most, hear it. Most people know that they're not living the way they're supposed to live. Most people know that there needs to be a change in their life. It's just making that step and listening to when the Holy Spirit draws you to Him, and then surrender. But I think everybody, from the time they're old enough to understand, you know that you need something in your life. God. I think that's what they're seeking. You know that. But they're scared of it. Everybody, everybody is drawn to it because let me tell you, you get somebody that's on that deathbed, you 
you talk to. I've talked to many of them. They're looking for something to grab a hold of. And sometimes it's just there, sometimes they're too late. Good point. Bernie? Isn't that what we do our whole lives, though? Yes. Until we do find him, we're always looking for him, but we don't know what. We don't know what. We know there's something. So we look for it in all the wrong places. We are a creature that's made to worship. And we're always looking for something to worship. We are. There's some places in there, though, that there is a point that when he talks about turning us over to a reprobate mind, when he lets go of us. And I do believe that there's some people right now that I, I, I'm not saying they don't have something inside of them that, yes, when he calls to them, that they will. But at some point... Their, their minds are so perverse. Yeah. Right? right? So, I mean, some of the things we're seeing right now, that, that takes a level of perverseness. Oh, yeah. And evil. And I'm not talking about so much. It is immoral, but it, it's a level of twisted perverseness that you have to be mentally... I don't, I don't yeah. think I have the words to describe it. You, you have to be broken. You've you got to be broke, right? Yeah. Fight against flesh and blood. Well, most people that become like that... So have you never distinguished that there is actually a good Everything is well. well, and that's really where I was going with this last comment, is that the fact of all of it in that statement in John 1, 5 is the reality is, here's the folks, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but God is God. I don't want to hurt your feelings. Your choice is your choice. But in the end, and this is the so, so much of the sad part. In the end, the conclusion, as you said in Revelation, the final part of the story, the final part is, here's the facts of life. You're going to spend heaven, or you're going to spend eternity in heaven, or you're going to spend eternity in hell. We can make all of our choices, but God already knows the, the, the outcome of our decision, right? And we can say, like I said, in today's world, in our man world, this is the way we're going to live our lives. We're going to live in this perverse fashion. We're going to denounce the things that we call morally good Be, even if you don't even get into biblically good just morally good is heavily strained right now right right so but in that fact we have to accept that god is god and god is all uh, is all in all that's what revelation 1 8 i'm the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end says lord he who is he excuse me who is and who was and who is to come the almighty the reality the sincerity of who that we're dealing with when god calls to us the fact of now the reason I bring that up to you look 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 quickly did you have a point I jumped over you oh, we, we jumped all around it. Yeah, okay it. I want to take you because I'm running out of time I want to take you over to uh, verse 10 real quick and in, in, in an example of, of kind of tying this back together I hope it said in verse 10 of, of chapter 4 it says then Moses said to the Lord oh my Lord I'm not eloquent neither before neither before nor since have you spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue now, he's already made several excuses to why he couldn't. This is kind of the final closing argument for him. excuses for what about what if Israel did this. I mean, Egypt did this. Egypt yeah. did. Now he's going back to himself. Yeah. Well, what if it's my, I can't do this. I'm yeah, I kind of jumped. If you look at, uh, actually, if you look at verses 3 through 6, 7, 8, 9, that's where he talks. God gives him the rod. He gives him some physical. He gives him a rod. He's telling him, this is how I'm going to do it. But then he comes to this part. And again, this is the, probably the fourth time that Moses in this short passage has said, I can't. Right? So in 10 he says, then Moses said to the Lord, again, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The reason I, I want to highlight that was who created the tongue? <laughs> You see, you see the simplicity but the beauty of the statement. Here's a man arguing with, what did I just read to you? In John 1, yeah. I am the truth, the life. I mean, I'm the, in the beginning was the word, the word. Nothing was created with him. I am the life, the life of the light of the men. I am the alpha and the omega. Point to drive home. I am dealing with God saying, would you do this? Moses is saying what? I, I don't talk well. I stutter. I don't have a good vocabulary. I don't like speaking. Who likes to speak in front of people? Most people don't, right? But in all this, God says this. In verse 11, Who has made man's mouth? Oh, who makes the mute, the, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? 
Now therefore go and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. It's really a pretty passage of scripture, right? You see, I got a murderer living in the desert who's supposed to lead these people, two million people. That's a big people, right? That's a big deal. I'm supposed to lead them out of captivity. And we go through all these series of excuses the whole time God's saying, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the, I just need you to stand up. I need you to hold up the stick, right? Who's making the, 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 the stick turn into a snake? God. Who brings the frogs and the flies and the blood? And God. He just needs the person to go like this, right? Mm -hmm. Huh? And when there's a story about Abraham, uh, was it Abraham that he, he um, told him to hold his hands up and he couldn't? And they were... Yeah, yeah. Was that Abraham? Moses. Was it Moses? I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, he was instruction, right? Follow what I tell you to do. It was Moses. And in the ultimate end, Moses says, but I, I don't even speak well. And what God's trying to say here, I created your tongue. I created your speech pattern. I created who you are. If I want you to do this, you can do this. I mean, that's a wonderful way to look at this. Are you slow of speech? Are you, are you slow to learn? Do you have dyslexia? Dys can't even say the word. That word. i got to say it backwards. Dyslexia. Uh, are you hard of hearing? I mean, what, what is our physical admonishment that we can put against ourselves that says, God, I can't, I can't do this? If, and again, this is the part, if nothing else, the whole, I mean, this is just one of them. But when you read these stories in the Bible and you really try to take them apart and put yourself and really look at the words and think, that's me right there. God, I can't do that. I can't, I can't. God is God. God Almighty. That, that's anybody that's ever been called to ministry. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sure. You know, I mean, if, if, if you were called to ministry, you found every excuse in the book to try to turn away from it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do this because I don't want to do this because. And let's face the number one reason. Why? Fear. Fear's one. I like to think the word inconvenience is a big one. Right. God, I got things I want to do. Yeah. You created me. You gave me this time. Here I am. This is what I want to do. The big one, I think, a lot of times is just flat and simple inconvenience. I want to drive my own car. <laughs> and I, yes, take your hands off the steering wheel. This is not a this is not a country western song. <laughs> this is not a, at, uh, at all. But no, that's really uh, that's that's kind of flying through it pretty quick. But that's what I was really trying to get to was that part right there of how how really wonderful that little simple statement is right there. Who has made man's mouth? Next time you, he's calling on you and you say, well, here's my list, right? Remember what? Who you're talking to. So that's what he kept trying to remind. Now, later, if you read the rest of the chapter, uh, he actually gets a little upset. Yeah, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. He said, it's not Aaron. And he gets Aaron to speak for him. Uh, he, and there's another example, right? So if you're going to tell me now, Joe, I can't do this, guess what? I'm going to give somebody to go with you. You, you mentioned earlier, he kind of chased in Jonah, right? Yeah. Well, we can definitely tell from this passage of Scripture, Moses was the man for this job, right? Now, we don't know exactly the time frame of all this going on or, you know, all that. I mean, as far as the duration of this, but we do know there was a conversation going on. And we do know that in the ultimate end, God took over every excuse that he had and said, here, you're going to, and what happened? He had to go do it, right? Well, the only one in the equation that didn't know Moses was going to do it. it was Moses. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You see, given the opportunity, God will complete the task in you. Do you all remember Philippians 1, 3 through 6? Right? I thank God for my every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. These tie together, they link together, they pull together because it is one ever-living word of God. And for everything that we can put up, can't do that, can't do that. For everything that we can imagine, this church can't do. Mm -hmm. The only thing that stops the church from doing what it needs to is the church. <laughs> right. I was going to say, how yeah, we're ever going to do that. Well, if we're going to have that approach to, I've never said, then guess what? Why? Because we're looking through our ability, right? 
I'm getting older, Lord. I can't. I just can't do that. I can't. I can't stay. I can't. Just can't go. I, 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 I. I was. I was walking yesterday, and I was stopping a visit. A couple of times. That's the church, and they said, "No, they, their job was on a Sunday." And I said, "Well, we have Wednesday," and that, that's what she does. She tells uh, uh, Mark and stuff, you know, pictures and stuff like that. She makes them. She come out there and she gave me this sign. She said, "Here, this is for you," and it says, "Wait, let God." And I thought, "Well, that's, that's pretty short, Barry. You know, just wait, because I always." Rushing in to things, making a decision I shouldn't make. It's just, just wait, let God. And I think, you know, a lot of times in our churches, you know, we'll just wait. We see God working. Just stand back, let Him work. And, you know, why God's working, there's sure a lot of blessing flies around the room. That's what I'm thinking, so I won't be here Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, no, I'm just kidding. I, I try to do that, but then Cindy rushes me in. And Oh. See it. Oh. <laughs> such such pressure, Sam. In the closing of in, in the closing of all this, I just want to remind you of a few things. It said God does not have the best. Excuse me. God does not use the best, and definitely not the purest, because again, none of us are pure. Amen. You just need to get over that. I don't know how many people the, the, when I get to talk to them that you know they, they've got they got this whole thing, and it's like. I'm not either. You're not. You just got to get through it. God has a mission. It will not be detoured. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what happens on this earth. That's what I was trying to say earlier. We can suppose all we want to, right? Whether we want to say theory, hypothesis. I know where you're going. <laughs> right? But the point to it is, man can think whatever he wants to think. God is God. Right? I mean, it's, it's something really to take with you to realize that no matter what, there's, there's two outcomes. There's two. Heaven or hell. And what really scares me, as I shared with you all last couple of Sundays, there's a lot of, quote unquote, good people. Just good people. Right? That have never accepted Christ. And that's what, what I mean, you know, I mean, they're just, you know, they're just good people. But they've never, ever, ever, you know, I don't know what we were talking about a while ago. I mean, in the world today, like, do they have that inner desire? I don't know, Butch, because I talked to some of the guys at work, and, and like, one guy told me, he said, you know, I've thought about that, so I guess it is in there. That's a, But then he says, you know, I just never have dealt with it. I, you know, I probably need to get to that at some point. Yeah. I think every, every, when, everybody right? knows it, and, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, it draws you. And once you start getting that conviction, you know, you may run three or four years like I did at a bad rate, you know. You know, I didn't want to change. I wasn't looking for God. Well, I'll tell you what. That's well, the last one I wanted to see. But on your point of Jonah right quick, uh, when God has a mission for you, He has a mission for you. I believe that. And until, and we could go, Jonah's a really great study, kind of like this one. You can really break it down. But when you look at Jonah, he had a mission for Jonah, right? And Jonah fought him all, even, even, I mean, he was even angry after it was over, right? Yeah. Even after, I mean, to see that was 124,000 lives, I mean, they, and Jonah was still mad, right? <laughs> so, but the point to it is, as with Moses, if he's got something for you, he's going to continue to chasing you until you accept the mission that he has for you. Why? Why? Because he identified you. And here's the other part of it is, if you really want a relationship with God, you would want the opportunity to serve him. Amen. And yeah, I keep driving that, it. That's where our not so pure tendencies come in. Is it? Well, mainly yours, and want we're want watching. Yeah, we've been watching you a lot. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want to do that. Uh, and again, uh, just capping this one off, God did not detail everything to Moses. He did not release. He did not, what, what's that word I'm looking for? He did not disclose. <laughs> Sometimes God does not disclose everything that's coming, but He still prepares you, right? He still does. I mean, uh, I, I think that's very clear. Um, and even in this case, like I said in closing, He, he even prepared, when Moses finally just said, I can't do it, he, he gave him Aaron, right? He gave him support. So one way or the other, it was going to happen, one way or the other. So again, I would just challenge you as you look at this, we, you know, this, would, like I said, was a pull off of, of looking at our confidence, but... Uh, and the words I love to use, and, and if I've talked to you, I may have, but sometimes I like to use the words, I'm going to take this away from you. 
Because so many times we're carrying this reasons of why, not just about God life, but life life, why we can't just live our lives and relax to yeah. some degree. Because we have this preconceived list of, and the best thing, sometimes you can talk to somebody and say, well, let me, let me take this away from you because I'm just as crippled, right? I'm just as sinful. I'm just as broken, right? I may have a different set of problems, physical problems, but again, and we even see this with disease, right? I mean, some people say, well, I have cancer. Some people say, I have this. Some people, but in the end, it's, it's a disease, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you, you, you need to take that away from you, not, not, you know what I'm saying? Take the excuse away from you so that you can live your life and, and do the best you can with it, right? Well, the disease we have is sin. Well, it's actually death, well, right? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's death. If you think about it for a second, if you, if you study Revelation, you'll find that, you know, man always, uh, he blames Satan for all this, right? You know, Satan's always in the world. He's in this, that, and the other. If you read Revelation, you'll see where after Satan's bound for a thousand years, man still comes back and sins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it must be pretty deep in our DNA, you know what I mean? Somewhere. Well, I kind of like it myself. I like it. <laughs> 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 God forgive them. They don't know what to do. Uh, we're back full circle. I'm losing control of this crowd again. Right? So, anyway, go home, read your Bibles, and pray. Goodness. Pray for Butch. Pray for Butch. He just assumes he's going to heaven. He's supposing again tonight, right? He's supposing. We want Butch. We might want to come out here pray a little while. You know, God, I thought I had this worked out, but I suppose maybe I need a little more work. Do you lie? You <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Bernie, dismiss it, brother. Oh, Father in heaven, praise be to your holy name, Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, oh, God, thank you for bringing your word to our hearts and our minds. Our opportunity to discuss and share, Lord. Oh, you're so kind to us. Help us be a blessing to you, Lord. And bring glory to your name as we go about. Oh, help us be the ones that draw people to you, Lord. Glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Invite somebody to come with you Sunday and we'll see you Sunday.